Now let's uh, turn for our uh, second reading and for our text uh, to Amos, the chapter that we were looking at in the morning with God's help, Amos chapter 7. We'll find the prophecy of Amos towards the end of the Old Testament after Daniel, Hosea and Joel. Then you find the prophecy of Amos, who was a prophet from the land of Judah, who was sent by God uh, to the northern kingdom of Israel and uh, to the religious capital of Bethel. And uh, in the first part of the chapter, we saw in the morning how Amos uh, gave three visions of God's judgment. And we saw too how uh, Amos was moved by God to intercede on behalf of Israel. And that prayer of intercession actually uh, delayed the judgment of God and gave further opportunity for them to repent. But then God shows him a third vision, uh, which uh, Amos doesn't respond to with intercession at all. So Amos delivers these visions and his intercession uh, to the people in Bethel. And then we find the response from a man called Amaziah. So let's read at verse 10, Amos chapter 7, and at verse 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from their own land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah, there eat bread and there prophesy, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is the royal residence. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I the son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel, and do not spout against the house of Isaac. Therefore, <clears throat> thus says the Lord, your wife shall be a harlot in the city, your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword, your land shall be divided by survey line, and you shall die in a defiled land, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from his own land. <clears throat> Again, may the Lord bless the uh, reading of his own word. And this time we can take as our text verses 12 and 13. Where Amaziah says to Amos, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah, there eat bread and there prophesy, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary. And it is the royal resident residence. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned there before the reading, we began uh, looking at this chapter in the morning. And we are essentially looking at this encounter between these two men. On the one hand, we have Amos, who is a divinely called prophet and who is faithful to his master. On the other hand, we have Amaziah, who is a professional priest of Jehovah and who is compromised both in his faith and in his life and indeed in his service to God. Now, we looked at Amos in some detail in the morning, or at least we looked at the particular series of messages that he was given to deliver. These were messages of judgment which were very hard for him to deliver. 
And that's why messages of judgment are sometimes called burdens in the Old Testament, because they're burdens to carry, and uh, they're burdensome to deliver. Uh, but as well as uh, giving messages of judgment, he also communicated to the people that he had interceded on their behalf. And on the basis of that intercession, God had hitherto delayed his judgment. And that means, of course, that God was giving increasing opportunity uh, to Israel to repent. But then God warns them that there is a a final judgment coming and uh, there is no intercession on Amos's part on behalf of that. That doesn't mean that they have no opportunity to repent. They most certainly do, but it won't avert the judgment. And uh, in our situation, that would be similar to a chastisement coming upon the land or a chastisement indeed coming upon people or individuals. A time may come when it can't be averted. That still doesn't mean that you can't close in with Christ and be reconciled to him. Now, this kind of message uh, took Amos into conflict with the established priests of Israel. And especially here in the religious heartland of Bethel. We saw in the morning that Bethel is effectively the religious capital of Israel. It's where the headquarters of the corrupted Jehovah worship uh, was located. Now Amaziah himself is part of the new order of priests set up by one of Jeroboam II's predecessors. In fact, uh, the very first king of Israel, a man called Jeroboam I, Now, if you remember uh, your Bible history, you'll remember that when Israel split away from Judah, the ten tribes in the north split away from the house of David in the south, that split was meant to be political only. And in fact, God said to Jeroboam that uh, as the first king of the new kingdom of Israel, if he would continue in the ways of the Lord, that the Lord would establish his house forever. And uh, that he would bless it just as he would bless the throne of David in Judah in the south. Now Jeroboam uh, didn't listen to what the Lord said. And he reasoned like a man would. He reasoned politically. He reasoned like a carnal man. He reasoned like this. Unless he said, I do something, then I will eventually lose this kingdom. And the ten tribes now under my rule will actually return south. They will return or they will reunite with the south if they keep going to Jerusalem to worship. If they keep doing that three times a year, they will eventually reunite and I will lose my throne. Now that sadly is what so often motivates people. Uh, Power, uh, things of that kind. His his overall concern wasn't the well-being of the people of God or their reunification. It was his own new position that he wanted to guard so carefully. So what Jeroboam did was he set up a rival center of worship. In fact, there were two. One was in the town of Dan, in the very north of Israel, and the other was in Bethel, which was pretty much at the border between Israel and Judah. And uh, he decided on a new form of worship, something to distinguish them from Judah. And so he had these calves built, uh, which were images of God. And instead of having to worship an invisible God, they could now worship him through the medium of these calves. So the worship would be more uh, visual, uh, more stimulating, more exciting. And he also, of course, appointed a new priesthood. He did. And uh, he chose the kind of priests that he thought would be fit for this new religious center. So these priests here in Bethel and elsewhere in Israel are priests in name. They are officially priests of Jehovah. They are officially worshiping Jehovah. But they're not real priests of God. Um, They're in the royal payroll. And... uh, They give the messages which the royal house is pleased to hear. Now, 
No, no, that is old hat, is it? You can't say that that's uh, something that was true once upon a time, but something that isn't relevant now. It is very relevant now. It always has been, and I suppose will be. Uh, I refer to them in the morning as preachers for hire, like Balaam. Balaam was actually willing to preach different messages to different people who would uh, hire him to do that. Although on a certain occasion, uh, God absolutely confined him to speak what he would have him speak. But these priests are priests for hire. They are time servers. They are serving the king. It's their job to be religious officials. Now, I want to, to look with you at this man here, Amaziah, the priest of Bethel. What a sad thing, by the way, it is that uh, Bethel should now have become the centre of a, a false kind of worship. We were thinking of this in the home here this afternoon. Um, Bethel, which had such a proud history as the house of God. That's what it's called, Bethel, the house of God, where Abraham built an altar. This is where Jacob set up a pillar and anointed it. And uh, this is where Jacob said that this place is the very gate uh, of heaven, the very house of God. And he said it will always be called the house of God. And uh, here it is now as a place of corrupted worship, still dedicated to God in name. But what, what goes on in it is not received by God at all. You know, I was thinking of this in terms of the many places, even throughout our own land, famous churches. Uh, and look what's in them. Look who's in them. You walk past places like St. Giles Cathedral, thinking John Knox preached there. What goes on there now? These are things uh, to make us sad and grieve. Well, I'm sure it grieved Amos to appear in Bethel, to remember what it was in the past and to compare it with what it is now. Now, I want to, to look with you at the encounter here between Amaziah and Amos. Amaziah is obviously opposed to Amos. That almost goes without saying. Um, <clears throat> he's not just opposed to Amos, but he's opposed to Amos' word. Um, in fact, the reason he's opposed to Amos is because of his word. He's got no other reason to be opposed to him. He doesn't like the words that he speaks. These words are, of course, the words of God, which tell us, of course, that Amaziah is opposed to the word of God. And uh, that is the ultimate contradiction when you have people standing in the name of God who are actually deep down in opposition to the word of God and in opposition to God himself. We see such people still, as I said, in the visible church and often in high office. Now, you'll notice that his opposition to Amos is on two levels. Let's consider them both. You first of all have what we could call a political opposition, or he is opposed to him at the political level. In verse 10, a Messiah sends a message to the king. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from their own land. Now, people talk about spin. And uh, they talk about spin as though it was something new. I remember reading some time ago, uh, people who said that this era of spin really began with new labor. Uh, but like everything else, Solomon tells us, uh, spin is not new. Um, spin has always been around. And what you have here, actually, in the speech of Amaziah or the message of Amaziah to to King Jeroboam is a classic case of spin. Spin, of course, is all to do with how you present something to somebody. And in fact, as I was thinking about it, I thought it might be useful to think of three words that are closely related to each other. Presentation, representation or representation, and misrepresentation. Think about these for a minute. Uh, the original presentation here is given by Amos. He gives God's judgments. 
He gives them precisely as God gave them to be given. He tells the people about the judgments of God and about his own intercession following these judgments. And that is a faithful presentation directly from God to the people through, of course, the prophet Amos. Now, what Amaziah, the priest, does is he represents Amos's presentation. He gives a representation. Now, when you represent something, you do more than present it. You give more detail and you give more context. And perhaps in a representation, you might distill the original presentation, distill it down to a few words, maybe the essence of what was said. But unless the person representing something or representing something or reporting something, unless he does it fairly, it becomes a misrepresentation or what we would call spin. And a person who spins well or who misrepresents is a person who can actually say the truth. But he misrepresents something because he wasn't faithful to the context. In other words, I could spin something to you uh, by telling you the truth. But it's not the whole truth, or at least it's not the truth in context. You find this going on all the time. You find it in the world of the news. You find it in the political realm. Is this what you're saying? And they represent what the person has just presented, and they represent it with their own context, with their own subtle shift of words, and so on. You'll notice that this is exactly what Jeroboam, sorry, what Amaziah is doing here to King Jeroboam. For example, in connection with the king himself in verse 11, Uh, Amaziah says to Jeroboam that Amos has said, you, Jeroboam, shall die by the sword and Israel shall surely be led away captive. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, the first thing that Amaziah has left out there is that Amos didn't say anything at all from his own initiative. What Amos said was what God had said. It's as simple as that. Because the Lord said, I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam. So Amaziah has conveniently left out God's role in the matter. And he's represented Amos as saying, it's my wish that you, Jeroboam, shall die by the sword. God is the speaker. God, but Amaziah has left that out. And again, you'll notice that strictly speaking, what God had said was, I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam. But Amaziah represents that as Jeroboam, or Amos is saying that you, Jeroboam, shall die by the sword. Now, there's a big difference between God saying that he will rise against him against his house with a sword, and Amos saying that he would die by the sword. You'll notice too that Amaziah says nothing about Amos' intercession. He says nothing about Amos' prayer for Israel. Nothing at all. And that was part of what Amos had delivered. Amos didn't just tell Israel about the locusts. He didn't just tell them about the drought. He told them that he had prayed, and he told them that on the basis of that prayer, God was delaying his judgment. But Amaziah just simply leaves that out. Doesn't fit his narrative. And what's more, he just spins it the way he wants to. Amos, he says in verse 10, has conspired against you in the house of Israel. Where does he get that from? Where does he get that from? Where's the conspiracy? Where's the evidence of the conspiracy? And then again, he comes out with a classic statement at the end of verse 10. The land is not able to bear all his words. In other words, he's he's coming close to the king. He's got the king's ear. 
The king's, of course, got him where he wants him. Look, everything's good here. There's a peaceful religion. We're doing well, and in fact, God's blessing the land. The economy has never been so good. People have never been so happy, never been so content. This man has come up here from Judah. He's actually creating dissent and difficulty. He's going to pervert the people. He's going to bring trouble upon the nation. He will divide the church. He's going to bring disunity into our midst where we're all happy and harmonious. He is just causing strife. The land cannot bear his words. Therefore, you shouldn't, King Jeroboam. And if you know what's good for you and for us all, you'll get rid of that man. So you'll notice that what's happening is that a Messiah here is bringing a political pressure to bear on the prophet. Political opposition. Now, friends, if I were to say to you that this is coming our way, that would be ignoring the fact that it's already here. But unless the Lord in mercy intervenes, and unless we really intercede and the Lord intervenes, this opposition is likely to increase. I don't know, but many of us could possibly be in trouble already because some of the words, because of some of the words that we've spoken. If people had a mind to scrutinize them and to tear them out of context and to represent them, not as they were presented, we would be in trouble. As the psalmist says in uh, Psalm 56 and verse 5, and uh, we'll read it later on and, and we'll sing it later on. Each day they twist my words. Let me just give me a second uh, to look it up in Psalm 56. You find this kind of thought here and there in the scripture, but he says, each day they rest or they twist my words. The actual idea behind the word twist is to do violence to them. They do violence to my words. The, the Hebrew word actually originates from the idea of carving something out. And what's actually being told us there is that they take the words and they carve them and twist them and make them mean what they want them to mean. So here he's suffering with that. Um, each day they twist my words. Their thoughts against me are all for evil. They meet, they lurk, they mark my steps. That's keeping a close eye on what he says and does, waiting my soul to kill. Um, you know what that's like. You know, there, all the time you hear it around you, people say, oh, did you say this? This is what you said. Uh, did you actually use this word when you were describing this? There's no care for the intention behind it. There's no care for the actual meaning, but they're just trying to trip you up and to, to snare you. In fact, Isaiah prophesied of this exact thing in chapter 29 of his prophecy. Uh, he says this, he's actually looking forward to a day when things will improve. Um, when the, the Holy One of Israel rises again and brings the terrible one to nothing. And, and listen to this. This is what God will do. Listen carefully. All those who watch out for iniquity are cut off. That's the people who are trying to find iniquity in the people of God. They are cut off. Those people who make a man an offender for his word. Now, that's exactly what we've got. We've got people listening for code words. Words, if you use them at all, you're in trouble for them. They make a man an offender for his word, and they lay snares for the one who reproves in the gate. Now, that's somebody who's officially seeking to reprove someone else in the name of God. These people are laying snares for them. Snares for the people of God. Laying a snare for the one who turns um, aside the just by empty words. So, these are, these are things that were spoken of as happening in days of declension and evil. And we have them now. But friends, you know, it's an interesting thing, but there's just a comfort in knowing that other people have experienced this too. We sometimes mourn about our day as though it was worse than other days, but it's not worse than other days. 
it's certainly worse than some days. And I've no doubt that if you go back 60 or 70 years, you would have a better day spiritually in this land. But you can go back further than that and find worse days. And it's a comfort to know that better men than us have experienced these things. People going behind their backs and reporting them to the authorities. We're no better than our fathers. But, but we rejoice because in these things we know that we are suffering for Christ's sake. And we are bearing his reproach just as he bore that reproach. And as well, we know that Christ knows. We know that Christ knows. As I, as I read there earlier, they will deliver you up to councils. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake. So here you, here you are being brought up before authorities. When they do so, Jesus said, don't worry about how you speak or, or what you speak. Don't worry about it. In these crisis situations, it will be given to you in that very hour what you should speak. Don't be afraid of a crisis. The Lord draws near to you in these crisis times because it is no longer, it is not you who speaks, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. And, um, and that is a comforting thought. So there's a political opposition uh, from the priests. Notice it's coming from the church. I told you um, a good few months ago about a, a woman who was uh, speaking on behalf of Christ. She wasn't a preacher, I don't mean that, but she was speaking on behalf of Christ and her engagement to speak in university was cancelled because of opposition from the local church, that she would be divisive, uh, divisive to the community. Isn't it astonishing what people can do in the name of God? But as well as this political opposition, there's a personal opposition too. A Messiah just isn't just opposed to Amos um, at the political level. He's personally opposed to. And you'll notice that the opposition here takes the form of intimid intimidation. And uh, after communicating with the king, he, he then meets Amos in verse 12 and communicates directly to him and tells him to go, you see here, and to flee to the land of Judah. There eat bread and there prophesy. Never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is the royal residence. And in fact, in verse 16, uh, Amos himself tells us what a Messiah had said to him. Uh, hear the word of the Lord. He says, you say, that is you, a Messiah. You are saying, do not prophesy against Israel and do not spout against the house of Isaac. Now, let me put these things together for you. The, Amaziah says essentially three things to the prophet of God. The first thing is don't prophesy here in Bethel. Don't do that. Don't preach your message here at Bethel. The second thing he says in verse 16 is don't prophesy against Israel. Or don't spout or drip against the house of Israel. And... Uh, Let's just take these the other way around. Let's begin with this idea of don't spout or drip against the house of Israel. This Hebrew word here, uh, you have it at the end of verse 16, don't spout against the house of Israel. Literally in the margin, we're told drip. It's, it's a derogatory word. The idea is that Amaziah thinks Amos is talking drivel. That it's a, uh, a relentless drip, drip, drip of what's irritating and aggravating in the land. And by using such an expression, don't spout against the house of Israel, he's actually showing contempt for the word of God that the prophet of God is delivering. Isn't it a solemn thing for people to hold the word of God in contempt? This was also true in Isaiah's day. I don't know if you'll remember, again, we looked at it some time ago, but uh, people were mocking Isaiah's ministry and saying uh, it's precept upon precept, it's line upon line, and it's here a little and there a little. And they were accusing Isaiah of treating them like children. 
as though they were intellectually at the level of children and speaking to them as, as, as though they were little children. Now, that wasn't a fair, uh, a fair accusation against a terrible preacher. I'm sure there are people who, who preach just like that. But this was actual contempt against Isaiah, the most elegant of all God's messengers. And you only have to read it in the English language to see that that's true. Such beautiful words, such gracious words from God through this prophet. He felt his own lips to be unclean and that he was not able to speak the word of God. But nobody really ever spoke. Nobody prophesied like him, I think, in the Old Testament. But that was the effect on the people. or That was the response on the people. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And Isaiah is exactly the same. You drip, drip, drip against this house of Isaac and against Bethel. In other words, he's essentially telling him to stop preaching, stop dripping. Is that the word of God to you? Is that the effect of the word of God to you? Is it possible that you're even listening uh, to this tonight and saying, well, this is just a relentless drip, drip, drip. It's an irritation and an aggravation. That may say more about the mind and the spirit you're taking to the word of God rather than my own ability, poor as it is as a preacher. Don't drip. And the second thing that he said was don't prophesy against Israel. Don't prophesy against Israel. Why? Well, because we're busy as priests telling them that everything's fine in Israel. From our baptisms to our funerals, we're all God's children. And don't you dare speak against us. We've got a religious harmony. We are heirs of the house of a Isaac. We are situated here in Bethel, the very house of God, where Jacob set up his church. How dare you say anything against us? Who are you? If, if you'll speak for us, speak with us. If you bring us words of encouragement and warmth and comfort, well, we'll receive you. We'll welcome you. If not, just go away. <laughs> There's a subtext here, too, because, of course, Amos is from Judah. And, you know, when people start to slip away from God, they become very racist and they become very sectarian in their thinking. We don't need, we don't need somebody from down south telling us what we should listen to. These things become important to people when they slip away from God. They look at where the preacher's from or what the color of his skin is or something of that kind. So don't preach against us. And again, he says, don't preach at Bethel. Don't preach against Israel and don't preach at Bethel. Why? Well, because he says it's the king's sanctuary and it is the royal residence in verse 13. Never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is the royal residence. Well, maybe he's also jealous in case he might lose some of his own hearers in Bethel. Who knows? But the reason that he gives is that it's the king's temple, king's place of worship, and it's where the king resides. Now here is real Erastianism. Here you've got a spokesperson from God who is actually subject to the reigning monarch. I am a servant of the king. Well you ought, a Messiah, to be a servant of the king of kings. And your Lord ought to be the Lord of lords. And the message that you should give to your king is the message that Amos is bringing to Israel, but you're not doing it. You've deceived yourself and you're deceiving the people. You've got the name of being a priest of God, but you are an heir of hell, and you're leading people to hell after you. As the Lord said to the Pharisees, you, you shut the door of knowledge on people. You take away the key of knowledge. And not only, the Lord says, are you as the leaders of the church are going to a lost eternity, but you're making your followers the same as yourselves. You're dragging them to hell. And sad to say there are official preachers of God's word who are doing the same thing today. These things don't change. These things don't change. The sad thing is that 
Some people just don't seem to recognize it. They're blinded by it. So basically, what Amaziah says to, to the prophet is, stop preaching against us, stop preaching amongst us, and in fact, stop preaching, period, because you're a drip and uh, you're an aggravation in the land. By the way, as, as, as well as telling Amos what not to do, he also gives him, shall we call it, friendly advice. In verse 12, he says, Go and flee to the land of Judah. There eat bread and there prophesy. Prophesy there and eat bread there. In other words, make your living there and make your living by prophesying. <clears throat> now, he himself is a, a priest for hire. He's under royal pay. <clears throat> And like other priests for hire and preachers for hire, they think that every preacher is a preacher for hire. He, he can't really envisage how, how somebody could be in it except for the perks as he's in it himself for the perks. And there are plenty of perks in Bethel as a priest. Just like every backslidden minister begins to think every other minister must be backslidden like himself. Just as every hypocrite amongst Christians begins to think that every single professing Christian is a hypocrite like himself. That's the way these things work. Um, the implication, the implication when he says, go to the land of Judah and eat bread there and prophesy there, is that, well, they'll take it there. <laughs> they'll take it there, but don't give it to us here. Your message, you know, Amos, is far more appropriate from the place that you came from. Take it back there. Don't take it here. I had a, a little experience of this myself, uh, not long after I began preaching, many, many years ago now. It was on the outskirts of Glasgow, and I preached somewhere, and I, I preached a message that was to do with God's judgment against sin and the importance of being ready for the judgment of God and fleeing a lost eternity. And when people were coming out of the church afterwards, this man came and shook my hand, and he was nice enough. And... As far as I recall, in his own way, he was complimentary enough. But what he said was, you know, that message that you gave today, he said, it was really more suitable for a Highland congregation than for people down here. And, you know, the more I reflected on that, and when I reflect on it still, I don't know if he could have said anything more disturbing. Nothing more disturbing about himself, really. That message is more suitable for the Highlands than it is for us here in Glasgow. That is, in effect, saying, get out of here. Well, I was kinder than that, but I'm talking about the spiritual implication of it. We, we don't need to hear that stuff down here. That message about sin and judgment is more appropriate for the Highlands. <laughs> Why? Are, are they worse people in the Highlands than in the Lowlands? Does God have a different moral standard in Glasgow than he has in Inverness? Does he have a different moral standard in Stornoway than he has in Canada or in America or in Afghanistan or in Australia or in Russia? Dear me. But that's essentially what this man is saying to Amos. Go to the land of Judah. Take your message there. There'll be an appetite for it. Make your living there by prophesying. To the people who want to hear it. Oh, friends, uh, there are plenty warnings in the word of God against having itching ears. And uh, <clears throat> Paul tells Timothy that days will come when people will have itching ears and they will select ministers who will scratch them. Because annoying as a niche is, it's very soothing to have a niche scratched. And when you have a, a minister telling you what you want, to hear as opposed to what you need to hear well that's that's really good it's a lovely message i'm sure amaziah was quite used to people saying oh well amaziah that was lovely oh amaziah that was nice but it wasn't soul saving it wasn't presenting eternity he wasn't dealing with heaven and hell he had a comfortable religion where everybody in israel was saved and their prosperity was a sign that that was so and of course, you can't really miss the implicit threat. Go, you seer, and flee to the land of Judah. From whom? Is that a threat? It certainly sounds like a threat. 
It's as much as saying, um, if you know what's good for you, get out of here. It's like when the Pharisees warned Christ. Um, we're told that the, uh, the Pharisees came to the Lord <clears throat> and they said, uh, get out of here, depart, for Herod wants, Herod wants to kill you. <clears throat> uh, now, it was very nice of them to be so concerned, uh, especially when they were busy laying snares and nets for him and plotting to kill him uh, themselves. Get out of here. Because Herod wants to kill you. Uh, the Lord's response to that is interesting. Go and tell that fox. And that's what he called Herod. Go and tell that fox. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. And the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must journey today, tomorrow and the day following. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. I know my danger. I know who's after me. I know who would seek to kill me. And by the way, that includes you. But I will journey on today and tomorrow because I know that I will perish in Jerusalem itself. But that's not going to hinder me from doing the work of the Lord today and tomorrow. And go and tell the fox that. Go and tell him that I'm going nowhere. Intimidation, that's it. Stop preaching against us. Stop preaching here, full stop. Stop preaching, full stop. And just clear a way out of here. Amos wasn't born yesterday. He knows when he's being intimidated, as we all should. We should be wise as serpents to these things and harmless as doves. I want you to notice his response. In verse 14, Amos answered and says to Amaziah, I was no prophet nor was I the son of a prophet. I think what, what he means there is, in fact, I can't help wondering if there's a subtle dig at the priest because uh, priests were priests by uh, genealogy, by inheritance. And uh, there was a, a greater danger, of course, with them that, that, that they just simply go along with something because they were born into it. Amos is saying, well, that's not me. He says, I wasn't a prophet. Wasn't all my life a prophet. Neither was I a son of a prophet. He says, I, I'm not doing this uh, because I somehow inherited it or because I was under family pressure to prove it and to do it or because prophecy was, was in my family. No, he says, God called me to prophesy. I was a sheep breeder. That's what I was. And I was a tender of sycamore fruit, which was quite a, a humble occupation. But the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And that's what the Lord does. He's always done that, and he still does it, and he very often does it, lays his hand on unexpected people. He took me as I followed the flock and said, go and prophesy to my people Israel. So you are telling me to stop preaching, but it's God who told me to preach. And if God has told me to preach, I must speak. Not because you say yes or no. And again, you say, don't preach here in Bethel. But God actually told me to preach here in Bethel. In verse 15, the Lord took me as I followed the flock and the Lord said to me, go and prophesy to my people Israel. And now I'm conscious that the call there is to Israel, but the Lord obviously led him to Bethel there. And Amos is saying, look, he says, where I go is not your choice, Amaziah. You're, you're not some kind of bishop here who, who tells me where to go. It's not my choice either, for that matter. I have no say in it. It would be foolish for me to run where I was not sent or to labor where the Lord had never assigned me a portion. It's not your choice and it's not mine. It's the Lord's choice. And when he has told me to come to Israel, even though I belong to Judah, to Israel, I will come. And you say, don't preach against Israel. But a Messiah, I must preach what God has given me to preach. Like Jonah, I have to be careful only to preach the preaching that God bade me preach. That, of course, famously is what Jonah did. And as I, as I mentioned several times, Jonah wasn't in the best spirit doing it. 
but he still preached the exact commission that God had given him to declare, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And uh, it doesn't matter who would come to him and say, oh, well, you know, that's, that's a gloomy message. He would say, well, I'm sorry, but it is a gloomy message. Being overthrown in 40 days from the hand of the Lord is a tiding of gloom, and you must respond to it accordingly. Go and preach the preaching that I bade thee, what I call you to say. And Amos is effectively saying, look, he says, when I'm saying that Israel will be led away into captivity, I'm only telling you what God has told me to say. I'm not my own master. What's more, I am an ambassador. The message that I deliver as an ambassador is the king's message, and it's not my own. What's more, Amos says, I've got another message, and it's for you personally. Your wife is going to be a prostitute in this city of Bethel. Your sons and your daughters shall be killed by the sword in this very city. This country shall be divided by a survey land, line, in other words, reapportioned and reassigned to a people that are not Israel at all. And you yourself shall die in a defiled land, in a heathen land, and Israel shall surely be led away captive. What a thundering message that was to give. And little did Amaziah think when he touched the Lord's anointed and when he did his prophet harm, little did he think that this is what the Lord would do in return. What a shocking prophecy to receive. The sad thing is that none of this would have been easy for Amos. Um, <clears throat> you know, false prophets don't understand how difficult it is to really prophesy in the name of the Lord. They, they just don't understand. Amaziah never had a burden in his life. But Amos had a burden. As I mentioned before, a burden is, is when you have to impart a message from God that's perhaps heavy or contains his word of judgment. And it's called a burden because it's mighty hard to carry. And it's hard to deliver too. And in fact, <laughs> even when you get rid of it, you feel the thing still on your back. And it would be a strange man indeed who took pleasure in declaring the judgment of God. Strange man indeed, and certainly such a man should have no place in the pulpit. If God takes no pleasure in the death of the sinner, well, neither should his ministers. Neither should his ministers. I'm quite sure it wasn't Amaziah who was sighing and crying for the abominations that were done in Israel and in Bethel. I'm quite sure too that it wasn't Amaziah who spent his time interceding for Israel. No. It's the prophet, it's Amos, just at Christ, as Christ did too. I mean, Christ spoke of the destruction of Jerusalem, did he not? He spoke of how people would raise her to the ground, not one stone left on top of another. But he did it with tears. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which uh, stones the prophets, killing those who are sent to you. How often I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings. But you would not. A prophecy of doom, but coming from a heart of love. And uh, may that always be true of those who speak the gospel to yourself. There are times, and, and this season of chastisement is a time that is crying out for warning. Yes, I am conscious, I am, that it does call out too for comfort and consolation and hope, and I hope we seek to give these things in due measure. But a season like this calls for this. If these things weary us and afflict us, what will it be like when the real judgment of God comes? If, if a coronavirus can make us feel heavy, what will it be like when the Lord sends his real judgments? And what will it be like when he sends his final judgment? And I say to you, not these things, not because I like to say it, but because God would have me say it. 
and because I cannot stand before him, not having said it. If a watchman blows the alarm or sounds the alarm on the trumpet, he is clean from the blood of the people. Unless you repent, unless you believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will surely perish. You will surely perish. Now, this is really a call to ourselves too. I know Amos is a prophet. He has an official declaration to make. But it extends to all of us. Don't compromise what we believe. Don't change what we say. Don't be bullied by the world or by churches that are churches in name only. Don't be bullied as to where to go or what you say. You stay loyal and stay true to your God. Serve him with gladness of heart. Serve him cheerfully. Stay upright as Amos did, and he will see to it, to it that you are crowned one day with glory and with honor. Remember, as Paul said to Timothy, and Timothy was having his, his own share of the sufferings of the gospel, the afflictions of the gospel. Paul tells him to be a, a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. And, you know, when we stand on Christ's side, there's no doubt in this sinful world that pain will come with it in different ways. But remember what he said to him, that if we suffer with him, we will reign with him. Stand fast. Uh, don't be tempted to be silent. Speak on. Stay where you are. Don't be moved because you are on the Lord's side and he is on your side too. Let us pray. Eternal God, uh, what a contrast between uh, two men who are both apparently doing the work of the Lord. And uh, we pray not to be deceived by names and by titles, but that we might discern the spirits to see those that are of the Lord and those that are not. We pray not to be intimidated by the world or even to be intimidated within the church. Help us to stand fast and to stand humbly on the Lord's side and not to be ashamed, knowing that if we confess him, he will also confess us before you. And if we deny him, then he will deny us before you. We pray on this Sabbath day that you would help us to think on the things that belong to our eternal wealth. Lord, hasten the day when we can gather together again, and send us a day, if it pleases you, of repentance, renewal, and revival, that we may see even the green shoots of that. It would be something if with Elijah we could see the formation of a little cloud, even the size of a man's hand. Suppose we were to see no rain, we would be thankful to see the cloud. Lord, do us good, we pray, in the Redeemer's name. Amen. Now, our last singing is from Psalm 56. I refer to it in the sermon, Psalm 56. And we're singing to the tune Strakathro. And uh, at verse 3, Psalm 56 at verse 3. When I'm afraid... I'll trust in thee. In God, I'll praise his word. I will not fear what flesh can do. My trust is in the Lord. Each day they rest my words. Their thoughts against me are all for ill. They meet, they lurk. They mark my steps, waiting my soul to kill. And go down to verse 11. In God I trust. I will not fear what man can do to me. Thy vows upon me are, O God. I'll render praise to thee. Wilt thou not, who from death me saved, my feet from falls, 
keep three. This is a man who he wants to cleave to God and not give way before men, but he wants God to help him in that. He wants God to help him. Wilt thou not, who from death me saved, my feet from falls keep free? Because this is what he wants, to walk before God in the light of those that living be. Wonderful words, as, as indeed all the Psalms are, as indeed the whole word of God is. So let's sing verses 3 to 6, that's two stanzas, verses 3 to 6, and then 11 to the end of the psalm. Let's uh, close our service by receiving uh, the blessing of God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.